you've got your Bibles, uh, why don't you open, up, open them up with me to uh, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And I'm going to attempt to talk uh, with a Ricola in my mouth the whole time and try not to stumble over my words. But Luke chapter 11, uh, we're going to pick it up where we left off last time. So that means that today we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 26. So let's pick it up there. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 14, it says, And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. And so it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided falls. If Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, then by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges." But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, well, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor which he trusted, and he divides his spoils. He who's not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And, and, and finding none, he says, I'll, I will return to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. And then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits even more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man shall be worse than the first. And so, Father, as we, as we open up your word this morning, we, we, we pray that, that your word would not only speak to us, not only challenge us, not only encourage us, but, Lord, for some of us, even set us free this morning. There may be some here today that, that feel like they're captive to something, uh, some thought, some addiction, something in their life that, that has a hold on them. And so we pray that you would, 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 as your word goes out to us, that you would set us free in this place. Uh, because we know that where the Spirit of the Lord reigns, there is freedom. And so we, we, we trust you, we worship you, and we turn to you now in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, now as we, as we continue in Luke chapter 11, we've titled today's message, Dealing with the Devil. Dealing with the Devil. I don't know, did you hear about the, the dyslexic devil worshiper? Uh, he, he, he sold his soul to Santa. <laughs> True story. You know, but, but, you know, sometimes we, we hear about these people who, who quote-unquote, made a deal with the devil, right? Well, before us this morning in the passage that we just read is evidently someone who, who, who made a deal with the devil even to the point that they now had become demon-possessed. Now, I don't know if you've ever encountered somebody who's demon-possessed. I don't know if you've ever bumped into this, but i got to tell you, it's, it's freaky. I mean, it's, it's real, and it's freaky. It's real freaky. In fact, I remember uh, a couple years back when we were over at our old building, uh, during the week, during the middle of the day, some guy comes in, a transient guy, a guy who, who would kind of bounce around, hop on a train, take the train from one place to another. So he comes in, and he, and he comes up, and he starts talking to me. And, 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 and as, as we're talking, he tells me that, that, that he's a, a Luciferian, a quote-unquote Luciferian, and that he's demon-possessed. And so as we're talking, he says, are, are you going to try to try to cast out the demons from us? He didn't say, are you going to cast the demon out of me? He said, are you going to cast the demons out of us? To which I thought on my inside voice, uh, check, please. Uh, <laughs> this is one sketchy dude right here. So as we're talking, uh, you know, I told him, no, you know what? I I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give you Jesus. Because when Jesus comes into you, he's going to cast out the demons. He's going to set you free. Well, at that point, the guy turns and he says, well, I know I need Jesus. I know that I need Jesus. And then all of a sudden, his voice changes and he says, but we don't want him. <laughs> I was like, okay then, weirdo. Uh, but, you know, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the devil? Well, that's what Jesus is going to show us this morning. In fact, to show us this, he now gives us three analogies, really three different word pictures to illustrate how to deal with the devil. And the first word picture that we have is, uh, is of a house divided, a house divided. The second word picture that we have is of a strong man who rules over a house. 
who has control over a house. And then the third word pictured this morning is of house cleaning, cleaning house. And so now we look at the first word picture uh, here as we pick it up again in verse 14, which is a house divided, a house divided. It says again in verse 14, and as he was casting out demons, let's read it again. And he was casting out a demon, hooked on phonics work for me, and it was mute. And so it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven, <laughs> to which I think, what do you call him casting out demons? Uh, but he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom uh, divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. And so if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, then by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, well, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so Jesus now heals this guy. As it says here, he, he was mute, unable to speak. Now, Matthew, in his version of the story, tells us, that, tells us that this guy was not only mute, unable to speak, but he was also blind, unable to see. And so Jesus heals this guy, but then he was also demon-possessed. And so now Jesus sets him free, and now it says that the multitudes marveled. The, the crowds were amazed. They see this, and they're like, you know, that just blew my mind. I mean, that just fried my noodle. I mean, I just, you know, mind blown. <sighs> I mean, it just, it just blew their mind. And why? Why did, it, why did it blow their mind? Why were they so amazed? Well, you see, you have to understand that, that in that day, uh, there were these Jewish exorcists, uh, these Jewish priests of sorts who, who would go out and, and supposedly cast out demons. Now, we don't know how successful they were, but there were these Jewish exorcists. And in those days, these exorcists taught that, that in order to cast out a demon, you had to first get the demon to reveal its name, to tell you what its name is. And so therefore, they believed that because this guy was mute, unable to speak, that, that this was really an impossible case. It was impossible to cast out this demon because this guy couldn't talk and tell you the name of the demon. And so now they just witnessed Jesus do the impossible, and it fried their noodle. <laughs> I mean, it blew their mind. But evidently, not everybody was impressed. Because verse 15 tells us uh, that, that some of them said... Now, by the way, Matthew, in his version of the story, he tells us who said this. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, it says, And the Pharisees said uh, that he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And so, in effect, they were, were basically accusing Jesus of being uh, demon-possessed himself saying that he had the power to do this because he was demon-possessed. And so as I mentioned earlier, now Jesus is going to answer their accusations by, by giving them three word pictures, three illustrations. Uh, the, the picture of a house divided, as we talked about. The picture of, of a strong man who rules over a house. And then number three, the picture of a house getting cleaned, cleaning house. And so now, first of all, the, the first word picture, a, a house divided. Because again, they said that, that he uh, cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Now, Beelzebub, by the way, uh, it, can, uh, it can, be tr can be translated Lord of the Flies, but literally, it's better to translate it from the Greek, the Lord of the House. The Lord of the House, the, the ruler of the house, the one who, who, who rules and controls the affairs of the household. Now, in this context, the house in question here is, is the human body. And so in effect, they're saying that Jesus was, was controlled by, he was possessed by, the, uh, by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And so now Jesus, you know, he, he basically answers them and says, you know, guys, look, you guys are nuts. It's in the Greek. Does you mean, your argument doesn't, I mean, it's inconsistent. It doesn't even make sense. I mean, why would Satan cast out Satan? That's just stupid. I mean, duh, again, in the Greek. He's, he says a, a kingdom divided against itself would not, would not stand. He says a house divided against itself will not stand. So why would Satan divide against himself? Why would Satan, why would the kingdom of hell, 
cast out the kingdom of hell. He says, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> now, by the way, what's interesting is, is, is that Jesus says, a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. A house divided against itself. You know, Satan's kingdom wouldn't even divide against itself. But what's interesting is that many of us as Christians are sometimes willing to do what, 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 what the devil himself won't even do. And that is, you know, a lot of times as Christians, we, we, we tend to fight with each other, right? I mean, as Christians, we, we, we tend to, you know, fight over silly little things like whether or not the gift of tongues is for today or, or the gift of healing for today. Or, you know, we want to fight over pre-trib versus post-trib or, or we want to fight over, you know, taste great versus less filling. You know, fight over this and we fight over that. You know, we, we, we want to we wanna think that our own little brand of, of Christianity is better than your brand of Christianity. It's kind of like the guy who, who died and went to heaven and Peter showed him around. This is a true story. And, and as they're walking uh, on the streets of gold, Peter shows him all these rooms uh, that are made of jasper and, and diamonds and just these brilliant, beautiful rooms. And then all of a sudden, uh, they, they see this one room and Peter says, wait a minute, see that room over there? Whatever you do, do not go in there. In fact, when, whenever you go by, I mean, don't even make a sound. Don't even make a peep. And the guy says, why? What's in that room? He says, well, listen, come here. You see that room? That's the room filled with Baptists, and they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> this just illustrates that, that the house of hell may not be divided, but unfortunately, sometimes the house of God is, the church is. You know, and so we, we want to talk about you know, Calvary Chapel versus you know, Southern Baptist or you know, uh, Fundamental versus Charismatic or uh, you know, uh, Arminianism versus Calvinism, this versus that. In fact, oftentimes somebody will come up to me and say, hey, you know, you guys over at Calvary Chapel, I mean, what are you? Are, are you guys, you know, Baptist or are you Pentecostals? Are you, are you fundamatic or are you, are you charismatic? And I just laugh and I say, well, we're neither. We're, we're, we're none of those. We're just, we're, 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 we're Bapticostal fundamatics. <laughs> because the truth, quite frankly, is, is, that, is that we're all a part of the same body, the body of Christ. We're all a part of the same body. I mean, hey, listen, for a moment, forget united in orange. It's united in Christ. United in Christ. We're all in the same body. I love the way the Apostle Paul dealt with it. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 15, the Apostle Paul said, it's true that, that, that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. Then he skips down to verse 18, but that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way, and so I rejoice. I will continue to rejoice. Listen, Paul had it right. Listen, if they're preaching the gospel of Christ and him crucified, listen, we're on the same team. I mean, quite frankly, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's Calvary, it doesn't matter if it's Northern Hills up the street or First Baptist or First this or First that. Listen, if they're preaching the gospel of Christ Jesus and him crucified and him raised again on the third day, they are our family. They're part of the same body. They're not our, our competition. They're not our enemies. They're our partners in reaching the lost. And so Jesus said, a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. And even the devil seems to understand this. And so now the second word picture is of a strong man who's ruling a home. A strong man who's ruling a household. And so we, we see that in verse 21. And when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when, when a, a, a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor which he trusted and, and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so now we, we have this second word picture of a strong man who's ruling a house. Now listen, as we look at this, uh, let me just say that, that whenever we talk about the demonic, that there's always like two extremes. I mean, on the one extreme, you've got those who, who, who you know, just ignore it altogether, pretend that it doesn't exist at all. But then on the other extreme, it's like you've got those who, who overemphasize it, right? I mean, it's like they see it. A, a demon everywhere. You know, a demon behind every bush, a, a demon here, a demon there, a demon everywhere. And, you know, it's kind of like that, that, that bit, that comedy bit from Flip, Flip Wilson. Uh, the devil made me do it. Now, if you, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember Flip Wilson. I, I'm not. Uh, that's why we have, uh, so we have YouTube. But Flip Wilson, some of you may remember, uh, was, was that African-American comedian 
back in the day. When I say back in the day, I mean way back in the day, like back in the Ed Sullivan show days, okay? Hey, I'm just saying, keeping it real. <laughs> and so Flip Wilson, he, he had this routine, right, where, where he, the devil made me do it, where he talks about, about the reverend's wife who went out and bought this red dress, and he turns and, and he says, that's the third dress you bought this week. And she turns and says, hey, it's not my fault. The devil made me do it. The devil made, that's right, the devil made me do it. I was just walking down the street, minding my own business, just, just walking down the street by this dress shop, looking through the window, and all of a sudden, the devil, he come up from behind me, and he said, hey, mama, that dress would sure look good on you. Why don't you go in there and try it on? Ain't nothing wrong with just trying it on. And then all of a sudden, he pushed me through the door. He pushed you through the door. That's right, he pushed me through the door, and then he put a gun on me, and he made me try the dress on. And then he said, ooh, that dress does look good on you. And the reverend said, well, why didn't you just say, get thee behind me, Satan? I did. But then he turned and said, it looked good from back here too, mama. <laughs> the devil made me do it. <laughs> but that's how people are, right? You know, oh, the, the demon of alcohol defeated me again, or the demon of adultery conquered me again, or the demon of this, or the demon of that. In fact, just the other day I was talking to somebody, and I'm convinced they, they've been defeated by the demon of stupidity. Uh, it's a true story. And so you, you have these extremes, and because of the extreme, you have, you have some that, that think, you know, it's not even real. It doesn't exist. But, but listen, I've got to tell you, the demonic realm is real. It does exist. Demon possession is real. And there are people who have literally made a deal with the devil. In fact, here's an illustration. I don't know how many of you grew up uh, in the 80s or 90s watching WWF wrestling. If you did, don't raise your hand. We, we want to protect the guilty. Uh, but if you did, then, then you probably remember the name Jake the Snake Roberts. Now, today, Jake the Snake Roberts is no longer a wrestler. In fact, he's a preacher. All six foot five, 270 pounds of him now is an evangelist preaching the gospel. But now, when, when, when he was a wrestler, a professional wrestler, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts became famous uh, not only for his cruelty in, in the ring, and not only for his $500,000 a year salary, but for the huge python he would drape around his neck. Hence the name, Jake the Snake Roberts. And I got to tell you, his nastiness in the ring, it, it wasn't just an act. In fact, anybody that knew him knew that he, he was a man that was full of hatred. His life was spinning out of control until ultimately Roberts accepted Christ, became a Christian, and walked away from his wrestling, a, wrestling career and, and ultimately became a preacher, preaching the gospel. Now, uh, in his own words, uh, Roberts says that his childhood was just one horror scene after another. It all started uh, when he was born to a 13-year-old mother. And because of her age, uh, he was actually raised by his grandmother until she died of cancer. And then when she died, uh, his father went and reclaimed him and his sister. And so then they went to live with his father and, and his new wife, but they would abuse both Jake and his sister. They, they would abuse them physically, they would abuse them mentally, and they would abuse them sexually to the point that his sister got pregnant when she was 13. Later, she runs away from home. When she's 17 years old, she, she gets married only to get kidnapped and then murdered by this guy's ex-wife. And so at this, Jake is, is just, just filled with hatred and filled with anger, and he makes a literal pact with the devil. He makes a deal with the devil, and he tells him that if he, if he can get him to the top, get him fame, get him money, he would do anything that Satan wanted. He said, quote, I didn't believe in God, but I sure knew that there was a devil because my life was a living hell. And he got to the top. But all the money and all the fame and everything that came with it, 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 it couldn't fill this void in his life, this emptiness in his life. So he, he turns to drugs and to alcohol and to steroids and to food and to sex. In fact, at one point, uh, he, he, he becomes addicted to crack cocaine. In fact, for the next seven years, he ended up spending as much as three thousand dollars a week on crack tried to kill himself at least four different times until at one point uh, in, in 1991 roberts uh, is attending an easter play with his wife cheryl and, and during the play all of a sudden he, he he says his chest felt like it tightened and he feels something inside he thinks he's having a heart attack later he realizes he's not having a heart attack it was the holy spirit convicting him <laughs> it's what i jokingly call holy heartburn 
And that was the night that he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And from that moment on, he's been preaching the gospel since. But Jake Roberts is, is an example of someone who not only made a deal with the devil, but someone who, who was ruled by someone even stronger than him. A strong man who was ruling and reigning over his life, destroying his life. You see, this is the picture that Jesus is painting for us in, this, in, in these verses. You see, when he talks about this palace or this home here, here in, in these verses, Jesus isn't talking about a, a, a single family home, not a, not a tract home. Uh, he's, he, rather, he's talking about a small fortress. Uh, this would be the kind of a home that a, that a governing official might live in. And because they're an important, ranking government official, they might even have a bodyguard, maybe even more than one bodyguard. Now listen, the, the point is, is that anybody uh, who, who wanted to invade and go in there and steal and rip anything off, they, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't invade this small fortress without first taking out the bodyguard, taking out the strong man. And so here's the picture. The picture is that, is that this fortress is really the human heart. It's the human heart. The strong man was the devil himself who was ruling and reigning, and he's now in control. You see, and this just reminds us that prior to our conversion, prior to us becoming Christians, you and I, we were under the power, we were under the influence, we were under the control of the devil himself. I don't know if you know this, but, but the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of this unseen world. And so before Christ came into our lives, we used to be under the devil's control. Now, you, know, you know, we used to think that we were free, free to do whatever we want, free to, 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 to party, free to drug, free to drink, free to do whatever we want. But we weren't free. We were under his power, under his control. He was the strong man ruling and reigning. Well, listen, if, if the devil is the strong man in the story, then Jesus is the one who's even stronger He's the one who can overcome him and, and, and overtake him and set you free and deliver you from the strong man. He's even stronger. And so he, he tells this, this picture of, of a house divided. Now this picture of a, of a strong man who's ruling over a house only to be overcome by the one who's even stronger. And now we come to the third word picture, and that is your favorite subject, house cleaning. <laughs> cleaning house. Verse 24. When an unclean spirit, Jesus says, goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. And then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits, even more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, I, I don't know about you, uh, but I've discovered that there's basically two kinds of people I in this world. Two kinds of people neat freaks and the rest of us <laughs> you know there's there's neat freaks and then there's and then there's mess, messy marvins right i don't know about you but i'm a messy marvin i mean if if during the week if you come into my office you're going to see that i i work in piles i got a pile here and a pile there and a pile everywhere i just you know it's just it's just kind of all scattered it's just the way i work i'm kind of a messy mar marvin but here's the ironic thing what's ironic is that even though i'm a messy marvin i still like things clean and neat I don't do it very often, but I like it. Yeah, but every now and then, you know, I, I, I go on one of these cleaning binges, right, where maybe I clean my office and I organize things and I, I put everything in little files and I and even buy little organizational things and I put it all together and it looks great. And even afterwards, it looks so good, I, I make a vow and I'm like, you know what, never again is it going to go wrong. I mean, you know, from here on out, I'm going to keep everything in its proper place. Everything will be organized. <laughs> Famous last words. It's like a week or so later, it's right back to what it was, right? Just total chaos. You see, the point is, is, that, is that there are people who do this with their lives. And so what we're talking about is, is moral or, or spiritual house cleaning. So there's people who do this with their lives. You know, maybe, maybe a crisis of some kind hits. You know, maybe, maybe it's a heart attack, or, or maybe they get a divorce, or, or maybe it's the death of a friend or, or a loved one. But something happens, and all of a sudden they, th they think, you know what? i got to make some changes in my life. And we've all known people that are, that are addicts, drug addicts, who, who realize they've got a problem. And, and so they make a vow that they're going to change. And so they go to rehab, and, 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 and they get cleaned up, and they even do good for a while. But then eventually, they go right back to their old ways. Why? Well, because uh, 
the house was clean and the house was swept. Everything was put in order, but it was still empty. It was still empty. You see, the problem is, is that we treat it like, like a New Year's resolution or, or like turning a new leaf. You've heard me say before that the problem with turning a new leaf is that once you've done it twice, you're right back to where you started. And so you don't need a new leaf. You need a new life. You need a new life. And so here's the picture. The picture that Jesus is painting here is, is of a person who's made a few changes in their life. They, they've got cleaned up. They've gotten their act together. But, but the root of the problem is really that they're missing God in their life. And so the, the sins that they struggle with, the addictions that they wrestle with, the habits that they, that they fight, uh, those are really just symptoms of a deeper problem, and that is that, that God's missing in their life. Everything's clean, it's in order, but the house is empty. The house is empty. Now with that, is, I want you to look at verse 26 again, and as we look at verse 26, the question for us is, well then, how do we deal with the devil? How do we deal with the devil? Verse 26 Jesus says again, then he, the demon, goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And so how do we deal with the devil? Well, first of all, we need to understand, we need to know that there can be no deals with the devil. There can be no deals with the devil. Listen, we don't negotiate with terrorists, and we don't negotiate with demons either, okay? There can be no deal with the devil. The Bible says in, in James chapter 4, verse 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But notice, it, it doesn't say toy with him. It doesn't say entertain him. It doesn't even say negotiate with the devil. It says resist the devil. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Flee immorality. Flee temptation. It doesn't say flirt with it. It says run from it. It reminds me when I was a teenager in martial arts, my, my taekwondo instructor uh, was, was a small little Korean guy named Yun Sun Choi. And, and he would always say, the best way, no get hit, is to no be there. And then he'd say, uh, self-defense lesson number one, front kick, groin, hot as can, hot as can. Uh, self-defense lesson number two, turn and run, fast as can, fast as can. <laughs> and this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, resist the devil, flee temptation. Flee immorality. The Bible also says in Ephesians uh, 4 27, do not give the devil an opportunity. Now, that word opportunity there in Ephesians 4 27 can also be translated foothold. Foothold, it, it's a military term. Because in those days, the, the Roman army would, would often overtake a, a small piece of land, a small territory, uh, where, where they could kind of set up camp. And then from there, they could launch their attack and then ultimately build a fortress, build a stronghold. You know, kind of like on D-Day, when all the Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy, the very first thing they did was, was to establish a beachhead, or a foothold, if you would, which would allow them to, to, to bring in more men and, and more supplies and more weapons. And then from that tiny little foothold, they would be able to push back the Nazi uh, forces until they ultimately uh, liberated France, delivered France. You see, this just reminds us that the devil is always looking to gain a foothold in your life. He's always looking for a place where, where he can set up camp, a place where he can launch his attacks. So we have to ask, well, well how, how, how do we give the devil a foothold? How do we give the devil a foothold in our life? Well, here's the context of that verse in Ephesians, that, that verse that says, do not give the devil an opportunity, do not give the devil a foothold. The context in Ephesians was that first the Apostle Paul was talking about anger. Because he first said, in your anger, do not sin. And then he continues in Ephesians 4.27, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Do not give the devil a foothold. So evidently, one of the ways that, that, that we can allow the devil to have a foothold in our life is, is by, by allowing anger to cause us to sin. You know, uh, you know, it causes us to sin against someone else. You know, so evidently, if you're the kind of person who, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, you, 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 you have a short fuse. Uh, you have some anger management issues. You might be giving the devil a foothold in your life, a place where he can launch attacks. But listen, that, that's not the only place. That's not the only way that, that we give the devil a foothold. You know, maybe your issue isn't anger management. Maybe you don't have a short fuse. You know, maybe you're not the road rage kind of guy. You know, maybe your issue is porn. Maybe your issue is prostitution. Maybe your issue is drinking or drugging. Hey, listen to me. Listen, 
the devil is always looking for any little thing in your life where he can set up camp, where he can set up uh, his base, where he can launch his attacks. This is why the Bible says resist the devil. But this brings up the question, how? How do we resist the devil? Well, the answer to that question is, is in that verse that we looked at earlier. Remember in James 4, 7, it says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so the very first thing, first of all, is, is, to, is to submit to God. Listen, the moment you submit your life to God, the moment you surrender to God, the moment you truly give your life to God, you have automatically resisted the devil. The moment you surrender to him and he comes into your life, you've resisted the devil. Now with that in mind, let's look again at verse 26. Because in verse 26, Jesus says, Then he, the demon, goes and he takes with him seven other spirits, even more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. Now notice that word dwell. In, in the original, the, the Greek here uh, carries with it the idea of settling down. And so this demon, he, he goes in and he, and he settles down and makes himself at home. In fact, what's interesting is that, is that this same verb is the same verb that, that the Apostle Paul used later on when he was talking to the Christians in the church of Ephesus. And he tells the Christians in the church of Ephesus that his prayer for them, over in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, his prayer for them is that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. It's the same verb. In other words, you have a choice. You can choose to, to, to have demons dwell in you, settle down, and, and, and establish a foothold in your life. Or you can have Christ dwell in you and set you free and, and, and liberate your heart. You have a choice. Because if the devil is the strong man, Jesus is the one who's even stronger. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 4, Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. He's come to set your heart free. He's come to, 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 to set you free. I love the, 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 the little booklet we used to give out. We'll have to get more. It's titled uh, My Heart, Christ Home by, by Robert Munger. Just a little book, just a few pages long. And in it, uh, Munger paints the picture of, of a human heart as a house. And he paints the idea that, 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 if, that if you've opened the door of your heart for Christ to come in, Christ comes in and he, and he comes into your house, he's going to live there. And he's going from room to room. And so you're taking Jesus from one room to another. So you go through the library, which represents your thought life, the things that you think about. Then you go to the kitchen, which represents your appetites and your cravings, the, the things that you desire. Then you go to the rec room, which, which, which speaks of the, the, your entertainment, the things that you look at, the things that you watch, even the people that you hang out with. But, you know, as you're, as you're going from room to room, you, you notice all this clutter along the way. And so you're, like, trying to clean up as you go so that Jesus doesn't see it all. And then the author concludes and says... Then a thought came to me, and I said to myself, I've been trying to, to keep this heart of mine clean and available for Christ, but it was hard work. I mean, I start on one room, and no sooner have, do I have it cleaned, than I discover that another room's dirty. And I begin to uh, clean on the second room, only to discover that the first one's already dusty again. I'm t getting tired of always trying to maintain a clean heart in an obedient life. I'm just not up to it. And then suddenly, he turned, and, and he said, I asked the Lord, and I said, Lord, is there a possibility that you would be willing to manage the whole house and operate it for me? Could, could, you, uh, could I give you the responsibility of keeping my heart uh, the way it ought to be? And with that, the Lord's face lit up, and he said, I'd love to. That's exactly what I came to do. Because you can't live the Christian life in your own strength. He said, that's impossible. Let me do it for you and through you. That's the only way that it really works. I love that old saying that says, he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Hey, check it out. You don't need to get cleaned up first. You don't need to, you know, get off drugs and, and stop doing this and get out of that and give this up and give up that before you come to God. You don't need to get yourself cleaned up and then come to God. No, check it out. You come to him. Ask him to come into you, and he cleans you. He cleans house. He drives out the strong man. He sets you free. And my Bible says in John chapter 8, where the Son of Man, wh whom the Son of Man has set free, shall be free indeed. He came to set you free. You know, maybe you're here, and, and maybe you're not free. I mean, maybe there's something that's got a hold on you. You might even be a Christian. 
And yet, there's something online that you look at on a regular basis. There's a person at work that you flirt with on a regular basis. There's something that you do with your money that you shouldn't be doing. There's, there's an addiction. There's a habit. There's something that's going on in your life, and it's got a hold on you. You think you're free. You, you can quit anytime you want to. You just don't want to. You just don't realize that you are its slave. It, it has you. It's in control of you. It's a foothold. Listen, he came to set you free. He came to drive out the strong man. Do you want to be free? Well, you can be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for, for your mercy. You haven't come to condemn. You haven't come to judge. You've come to free the captive. You've come to, to give life to those who feel hopeless. You came to give a future to, to those who feel like there isn't one. And you came to set the captive free. You know what? Just like Jake the Snake Roberts, maybe there's something going on in your heart right now. That holy heartburn we talked about. Your heart is just, it's, it's, something's going on. And, and you feel like there's this battle. And, and, and you feel the Holy Spirit, he, he's, he's, he's working on your heart because he loves you. And he wants to set you free. But then you've got these other voices telling you that it can't be done. And, and, and nobody's going to love you. Nobody's going to accept you. Or, or how are you, you know, what about your friends? What are they going to think? You know what? None of that matters. Today is your day. You can be free. Do you want to be free? If so, would you just, right where you are, just raise your hand, and we want to pray for you. I see that hand. And maybe you're a Christian. You've already given your life to Jesus, but man, you struggle. There's something that's got a hold on you. Do you want to be free? I mean, really free. Then raise your hand, and, and by raising your hand, you're saying, Lord, I, I set me free from whatever this bondage is. I bet you just, just we had several do this in the first service. If you need to be set free, just raise your hand. Lord, for those that raise their hand, we, we pray that you would have mercy on them. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Lord, if they're a believer in you already, if they, if they know you personally, Lord, I pray that they would give you the key to every closet in their heart. No more skeletons in the closet. No more secrets. That they'd come clean, they'd confess. Because your word tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. So have mercy on us as we're sinners. Forgive us. Wash us. Cleanse us. Set us free. In Jesus' name. Why don't we stand and worship? Stand and worship. After worship, grab a chair and bring it up to the...